Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well, and welcome to tonight's second half. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please share this video and leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, they do matter. Now, everyone, I've taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's second half, shall we? Today's first encounter. The year was 1977. I was a high schooler in Maryland. My friends and I and many other classmates would frequent an area that had somewhat of a reputation for being the hangout, both before and after the sun went down. It was late May of that year with all of us just itching to get outside any time we could, having endured a rough winter. A buzz started to go around school about some kids saying they'd seen a monster or something of that sort, while at the hangout spot. Having said as much, there was a lot of bad drugs going around at that point in time, and I knew there were a fair number of students who were sampling them, with some of them having been killed for their efforts. It was a crying shame. Nevertheless, when I heard the rumor, my first question was, who started it? My thoughts were that someone was suffering from some type of drug-induced hallucination which rendered them seeing a monster in the woods. Suffice to say, myself and some other non-druggies were still frequenting the spot. But amazingly, the amount of young people who were still coming there had greatly diminished after the rumor had made its way around campus. It was a Friday evening when seven of us piled in my friend Jay's van and headed over to the area. Now, Jay's parents were quite wealthy and had bought him a brand new conversion van, complete with chairs, bed, table, and stereo. We all just packed in it and sat at the end of the dead-end street for the evening. Having arrived just before sunset, we were all outside in the open lot. We were having a catch with several frisbees until the sun had set, listening to music and having a good time. Now, I didn't drink or do anything at the time, and all of us were underage anyway, but my friend Wendy had gone into town and without being proofed by the owner of the liquor store had procured a bottle of premixed screwdriver crap. Basically, it was vodka and orange juice. And she drank the entire pint warm. It was about an hour after sunset that Wendy had went outside into the edge of the trees and began to puke her brains out. Suddenly, she lets out this scream and comes running across the van, leaping into the side door, saying there was some type of monster in the woods, with all of us trying to come to grips with what she was jabbering about. Jay, who was sitting in the driver's seat, suddenly shouts, Oh my God! and threw the headlights on, illuminating this monstrosity of a beast in the edge of the forest. As soon as the lights hit it, the creature raised its arm to shield its eyes from the lights. The girls all screamed. Literally a second later, the monster dropped its arms and made a loud, snarling sound and took two steps toward the front hood of the van. Jay basically started the van and dropped it into reverse as fast as it could possibly be done, and everyone in the van went flying and tumbling around as he floored the van, first in reverse and then in drive. This thing that we had all seen appeared to be half man, half mountain goat. 
It was covered sparsely in what I would say was hair and had a large pair of horns which curved from its upper forehead to the back of its head. It had very long ears that came to a point at the top and its face was long and narrow also ending in somewhat of a pointed-looking chin. Its nose and eyebrows looked like they were connected in the form of a protruding-type ridge, with its nose having many distinct wrinkles in it when it snarled, kind of like a timber wolf when it growled. It was very frightening, to say the least. The body was extremely muscular, coming from the chest down to a very lean and tapered waistline, and its legs were long and skinny, but equally muscular in appearance. The eyes in the headlights were glowing a fluorescent green, and its snout seemed to be angled downward, beginning just below its eyes, in such a way that when it snarled, we really couldn't see its teeth. None of us ever went back there again, and to this day, I still am left wondering what exactly it was that I saw that night. In Maryland. Today's second encounter. It was mid October of 1986, and I had gone to visit my cousin, Blake, who lived just outside of the town of Elkhorn, Wisconsin, the city being named supposedly by a man who had found a pair of Elkhorns in a tree. At any rate, I had a little time off of work and had gone to visit him for a few days. I believe it was a Friday evening when the two of us were indulging in a couple of beers, and a conversation took a turn with Blake starting to talk about this so-called monster of Bray Road, if I'm correct, and it really doesn't matter as far as what happened goes, the area in which he lived and where this supposed monster dwelled was called Woolworth County. He went on and on about a variety of different people claiming to have seen basically the same thing, which was a tall wolf-like monster that walked on two legs. Some of the claims that of seeing it in the cornfields, with others having seen it near farms or crossing the road in other areas for a number of years. It was then that I had breached the subject of Bigfoot, saying that maybe what they were seeing, in fact, was a Bigfoot. But Blake was empathetic in that he stood his ground, stating that it was most certainly not a Bigfoot, but rather a tall, lanky wolf-type creature with a long canine snout and pointed upright ears. Well, the night ended, and two days later, the visit ended as well. And I was back home in Illinois. Two years later, the fall of 1988, when I once again had gone to Wisconsin to visit my cousin. Blake had arranged us to do a little bird shooting in a cornfield that was owned by an acquaintance of his in the area. I should mention to you and everyone else that the enormous proportion of this area of state was predominantly used for dairy farming and corn production. There are fields and farmhouses which are bordered by strips of trees like fence lines everywhere you look. We had made our way over to the farm, I'd say it was 1 p.m., and we're working our way through another field of standing corn stalks, if that's the proper terminology, when Blake said, did you see that? Now we were walking side by side through the standing corn that was quite a bit higher than our heads with one row in between us separating the two of us as we walked. I said to Blake, did I see what? He said that something had just run by his left-hand side through the corn that looked like a huge dog. At this point, we're in the middle of a large field of standing corn, far from either side of the field, and Blake was saying that there was a huge dog running around in here that we could not see. My immediate thought was that I hoped it was not vicious, because it could have easily come after us from any angle and bite us, and there would be little, if anything, that we could do about it. We certainly wouldn't start firing shots blindly, especially with the two of us paralleling each other through the field. We stood and listened as both of us had heard something rustling in the corn 
coming from different directions, but nothing else was visible. I have to say, at the time, it did seem like something was circling us, moving at a very rapid pace. Either that, or there was a couple or more critters making all of the noise that we were hearing. We decided to make our way out of the field, and as we did, Blake was going to keep his eye looking forward and to the left, while I was going to keep an eye behind us and look to our right, just in case there was a pack of dogs circling us, or even coyote, against which we could hopefully defend ourselves if need be. It was only a few moments into moving out of the corn as the two of us were moving side by side that Blake said, Son of a bitch, what was that? As I turned quickly to look, my view of the direction in which he was looking was broken up by the standing corn between us. While he was looking straight down a row between the stalks, he shouted, You mother jumper! Pulled the trigger, after which I heard a loud kind of deep yelp which was followed by something running through the corn away from us. He then said, Start running and don't stop. As we were both now tearing up through the cornfield, heading back in the direction that we had just come from. When we broke clear of the field, we stopped to catch our breath. I asked Blake what he had fired upon, having seen nothing myself. He told me that this thing had first stepped into the corn row in front of him. It was on all fours and appeared to be a very large canine, almost like a timber wolf. He said, as his mind was trying to process it, it didn't make any sense with nothing of the sort being known in the area. It was then that his mind shifted gears to start thinking about the monster of Bray Road. And before he could really make sense of anything, this beast stood on its feet and took a step towards him. That's when he pulled the trigger. He described it as being at least seven feet tall with long, thin, muscular arms and legs. When it was on all fours, its rump stood much higher than its forebody, looking like it was more of a crouched position, as if it was ready to launch itself forward. As it stood erect, its legs had somewhat unfolded, revealing how tall it actually was. He said that its face reminded him of the character Wiley Coyote in the Roadrunner cartoon, having a long snout with visible teeth both top and bottom, and its claws appeared to be more along the lines of hawk talons than what anyone would see on paws of a wolf or a large dog. Blake was now fully convinced that he had become the latest to sight the infamous monster, and who was I to argue with him? I only wish I had seen it as well. Today's third encounter. It was May of 1991 that my friend Lewis and I had ventured into the park for a little day hike. We were carrying a short cooler with some beers and sandwiches and had planned to take it easy for the day. This area was southeast of Mendville, which is fairly close to where I live. But my dear friend Lewis has passed on since. Anyway, on that day in May, we were making our way down to the shore area of the Gulf, where when you reach it, the Gulf is on one side and there is marshlands on the other, with a strip of land that you can walk on between the two. There is a tremendous amount of wildlife there, including a number of critters that can take you out if you're not careful. Lewis and I were not ignorant of the dangers in our area, having spent most of our lives hunting and shrimping. And I would say without any hesitation that Lewis was a born hunter. When it came to tracking and navigating the swamps, he was the best of the best, I guarantee. So, we had made our way into the area by the Gulf when Lewis pointed out some unusual tracks in the mud. I use the word unusual because... I had seen virtually every track there is to see, including those made by a variety of snakes when slithering along, and I had never seen anything like these before. As we stood there looking down at these tracks, there was a long foot of some type, being very narrow in the middle with three extended toes on the front, 
and something like a talon on the rear portion of each foot. They looked very much like the foot of a large bird of prey, such as an eagle, with the exception being that these were at least 16 inches long. We were no man's fool, and there are no birds around these parts or anywhere else with feet like that. This much we both knew, but there they were, and there was no doubt about it. Once we had laid our eyes on the first, we quickly picked up on literally hundreds of them, which were all over the area and leading eventually into the marsh. Lewis said to me, Brother, these are the tracks of the Rougarou or Dog Man, and we need to be careful in here if we want to live to have dinner. I didn't believe that there was a single Cajun who has not heard tales of the Rougarou, and these tracks were making believers out of us for sure. The tracks were fresh and deep. In six hours, they would be washed out and unidentifiable from just the moisture of the soil. If this was the Rougarou, it was here not long before we had been, and was most likely still in the area. We laid the cooler down and began to sneak around in the grass trying to catch a glimpse of any activity of the creature. Now there are all kinds of nasty snakes here, so we were being careful, when suddenly we heard what sounded like a man running through the marsh, and then it went quiet. The two of us looked at each other, backed up from where we were, and went a little further along the dry land to re-enter the marsh grass in the direction of where we heard the running. As we were entering, parting the grass with our arms, as we walked, Lewis lost his footing and fell in a heap, making a large splash and cussing up a storm. Seconds later, we heard a very low growl like a mad dog coming from the marsh. As we looked through the grass, there, standing in the marsh, was what looked like a dog with a human-shaped body. It was standing mid-calf in the water, having long, thin, muscular legs and arms to match, and its head looked very much so like a wolf. There wasn't much hair on its body, but the head had quite a bit. There was a long snout with a black nose and pointed teeth. It looked just like a painted German shepherd. I have to say that it was at least seven feet tall, taking into account it was standing in the water. Its arms hung by its side just like a human, but the hands were very different, kind of matching what the tracks looked like. The fingers were long and spindly, with what seemed like talons at the tips, just like those of a hawk, only straighter and round. This thing was not moving. It was just staring us down like it was going to attack at any second. Lewis looked at me and said, Brother, let's just ease out of here. We started backing out with one eye in the direction and one in the other. While listening for any movement in the water, and there was none, we turned up the heat on our walking and left the place lickety-split. I never walked so fast in my life. In fact, we had bypassed where the cooler was and just left. I have no idea that thing was or where it had come from, but it was there and we saw it. I don't expect many to believe this, and trust me, I have told a few, more than a few. This is the kind of thing you hear at a pub after the regulars have consumed a few, but this was no ghostly apparition. It left physical tracks and moved the water with legs. This was flesh and blood monster. This was the Rougarou or Dog Man. Today's Fourth Encounter it was January of 2011, and a group of hikers were climbing the rocks in the southern part of Colorado. A group of friends had spent much of the day climbing, enjoying each other's company, and were reluctant to head back to the car when the sun started to fall in the sky. At last, they decided that they had enough of their adventure, and the group headed back to the car. Ray Dormer, the only survivor of the incident, told the police what he believed attacked him that night. Ray states that the group had parked about two miles away from where they were climbing, 
And though they had intended to leave for the car earlier in the day, they had been having such a good time and ended up losing track of time. He stated that when the sky started to turn an orangish with the setting sun, they knew they needed to hurry to get back to the car. But the terrain was difficult to walk through, and in spite of them all being avid and experienced hikers, the progress was slow. They tried to keep moving quickly, but the rocks would randomly slide down a slope in front of them, slowly slowing them down. They weren't too worried about losing light, as each of them had a lamp on their hats. But Ray states they had a funny feeling that something bad was going to happen. They came to a section on the trail that was largely hidden by shadows from the tall rocks on the other side of the hill. So each one turned on their lamps, and they continued, but that's when it happened. Out of nowhere, this massive creature, close to eight feet tall, jumped out from behind them. Ray said the creature took them all by such surprise, no one knew how to react. It leapt like a dog, but when it landed, it was hunched over, as though a person was bent down as they were trying to run. It had long, sinewy arms and curved back legs, but its hair only grew in patches on its body. It had a massive head with a broad snout that reminded Ray of a bear, though he said that its ears were more like that of a wolf's or a coyote. It had long claws at the end of its hands, if they could be called hands. It had partially formed fingers, which looked like paws only much longer. Ray states that the creature was snarling and snapping at them, and in the confusion they panicked. He states that they all began to run up the trail as fast as they could, trying to reach the car, but the sound of the creature showed them that it was right behind them. Ray said that he heard one of his friends scream and knew that it must have gotten them. He was too terrified to turn around or even look to see what happened. He states that he knew he should stop and that he should try to help them, but fear had taken over. He hardly remembers what he was doing. He reported to the police that he continued to run, and as he did, he could hear the sound of both of his friends running and the creature running behind them. He would hear another scream, but again, in his terror, he was too afraid to stop. Ray states that he ran all the way to the car, tripping and falling twice in the process, and convinced that at any moment he too would be grabbed by this monster. He states that he doesn't know what happened to his third friend, just that the two of them were running side by side one moment, then he was alone. At the car he called out for his friends, but he didn't hear any reply. No shouts, no screams, just dead silence in the evening. Feeling terrified once more, he states he jumped into his vehicle and drove into town as quickly as he could. He reported what happened to the police who immediately sent officers to the area. Although the officers scoured the area, they were unable to find the monster who had hunted Ray and his friends down. They walked up the trail to where his friends were last seen, but they were only able to locate the remains of one of them. Ray's friend had been torn apart, clearly slashed open with something that was very long and sharp. As with the other reported dogman attack, his friend had punctured marks. The puncture marks were too far apart to be inflicted by a regular wolf or coyote. In spite of the extensive search, his other two friends were never found. A thorough investigation ensued, and the final conclusion was that they were attacked by a bear. But Ray knows what he saw, and he is convinced to this day that that creature that attacked him and his friends was definitely a dog man. Now, I looked into that, and I did find a attack that happened in 2011 uh, in Colorado, but not the name that was used in this um encounter so i don't know if the name was changed or what but there was an attack and 
one person had been torn apart uh, by a bear and uh, one other friend was mentioned, not two. So there was supposedly three, not four friends. Um, the other presumed to be dragged away. So not really sure what to make of it, but it's pretty detailed. So, and like I said, there was an attack by a bear in 2011. Once again, we don't know the exact location, so it's kind of hard to uh, really pinpoint and triangulate. So let's move on to tonight's final encounter. This is one of the experiences or encounters that has really stuck with me for a while. My two brothers and I were out camping in the woods at our favorite spot. We kind of found it by accident when we were little, when our dad took us out there during one of our trips. It became our unofficial camping site from that point on. It's a clearing in a national forest, but it's not a place you would find if you're faint of heart. We're very experienced in the woods, which made it perfect for us. Even though we couldn't go out there all that often anymore, my brothers and I, we still went there every once in a while when we could manage to still get together for old time's sake. It was late at night and we had built a fire. We were just sitting there talking for some time when I thought I heard noises like something moving up ahead of me in the nearby trees just out of range of the firelight. We looked there and I thought I had seen an outline of something tall standing there looking at us. Something was off, but I thought it was possible for it to be someone who had gotten lost. My brothers didn't agree with me and kept saying that something wasn't right because he just kept standing there. He didn't approach us. We called out to him, but he ignored us and moved back into the trees instead where we couldn't see him anymore. But he didn't keep going. I mean, he made noises walking a couple of steps back into the trees, but then it felt like he didn't leave but he just stopped and stayed right there. We all are fairly sure whoever it was was hiding there in the trees. I can count with fingers on one hand the number of times we had come across another person that far out in the woods like this before. In all the times we went out there, it isn't to say that it couldn't happen, but it just didn't happen. It wasn't a usual occurrence for us, and I didn't like the thought that someone was there and hid from us like that. You know, since we called out to them, and they obviously knew we knew they were there. I didn't take it as a good sign about their possible intentions that they hid and didn't answer us back or just leave. And I thought that it was someone and they possibly wanted to attack us or steal from us. My brothers and I were all armed, but you can't go just shooting people. You have to make sure that you don't shoot them. I mean, it could be a drunk guy messing with us, or it could be someone lost in need of help. But who's going to be messing around with us out there so late at night? I didn't think it would be someone messing around, but I had to make sure that they were not actually up to something. I got up and walked closer to the trees. My gun was drawn and tried to shine my flashlight on what I still believed at the time was someone hiding in the trees. When I got close, the smell of wet dog and urine hit me like a blast out of nowhere. Then I heard the movement up ahead and saw something move behind a tree, just as I caught it with the light. I saw a head sticking out from behind the tree and then I knew it was not another man like I thought it was. I stood there dumbfounded at a total loss of words. I expected to see a person, but what I saw was a long snout, and then its teeth as this thing curled its lips and snarled at me. I backed up in the direction of my brothers and the fire, my flashlight and gun both still aimed at this thing, and it came out from behind the tree and followed me. It snarled at me the whole way. I couldn't make sense of what I was looking at. There was no question it was a wolf. It looked exactly like a wolf, but it stood and walked on two legs. There was no way for me to understand what I was looking at. 
nothing. Not only was it a wolf on two legs, it was muscular and taller than I. I'm 6'3", and still had to look up to meet its eyes. It was not something I ever envisioned myself seeing at any time in my life. I had never ever considered the possibility of having something like this happen. There was no way to make sense of it. If my brothers hadn't been there to back me up on what I had seen, I would have convinced myself that I was dreaming or made the whole thing up, got my facts and memories mixed up, but no, they saw it as well. You know what we saw. It had a black coat, pointed ears, head, fangs, eyes like a wolf. It was much larger and looked heavier than any wolf I had ever seen. But it was still a wolf, not a black bear standing on its hind legs, believe me. When I say I know the difference, it showed me its huge canines and walked toward me on its hind legs, looking at me all angry like it wanted to tear me apart. I was focused on it. I couldn't look away from its eyes. It had hellfire red and orangish eyes. But what stood out to me was there was so much rage and malice in its eyes. Let me just say that I'm not a guy who scares easily. I faced bears, but this thing terrified me in a way no other event in my life ever did. Nothing ever scared me like it or made me feel I was seconds away from being killed the way this thing had made me feel. I knew without hesitation, without a shadow of a doubt, that this thing wanted us all dead. I aimed my gun, but heard one of my brothers fire a warning shot before I could even do anything. It didn't stop, and it was not a man wearing a costume messing around with us. Otherwise, he would have made that clear right there and then. The joke would have been over. Instead, it got closer, and both my brother and I fired more shots and hit it in the stomach area. It ran back into the woods that time, and it ran on its hind legs. We shone our flashlights in the direction that it had run. I tried so hard to track it with the light, but it moved so fast I couldn't keep up with it. When you find yourself dead set focused on something like that, you try with all of your might and all of your concentration to find it somewhere out there in front of you. It had all of our attention. You're trying to locate it. The last thing you think about is that there's another one sneaking up from behind you. We heard the growling behind us, turned around, and saw there was another one. It would have gotten us, but the growling gave it away. That was the only clue, the only thing to indicate that it was there. There was no other noise or any sound of movement behind us. It looked exactly like the first one, but even bigger. I don't know if it was just the same one, but I don't think it could have run that fast to get behind us, and it was bigger. It also didn't have any wounds on it where we had shot the first one. This one also walked on its hind legs. It was close to my brother and caught us by surprise. He was caught off guard and before he had time to fire on it, my other brother let loose and shot it in the head. It ran back into the trees and we heard it run off into the distance. Then we didn't hear it. We didn't hear anything anymore. That was enough. We got our stuff together and got out. We were not staying there for the night. The trek back to our truck was nerve-wracking. I told you, I don't scare easy. Plenty of noises happen out in the woods, but I don't jump at them. After what we had just gone through, I jumped at every noise on the way back. Every noise scared us and had us on edge. We made it back to the trucks without further incident, though. We never went back there camping again. We didn't talk about it to each other for a very long time. It's been a long time since then, but trying to get over what happened is still very difficult to me. I've had nightmares ever since. I've tried very hard to put it out of my mind and just forget it. There is now a deep dread of going into the woods that I feel, that I had never felt before as far as I can remember. Honestly, I haven't gone back camping at all since then, and neither had my brother's. We all have families. I just don't think it's worth 
to put your family at risk of not having a husband or a father or any more by getting killed out in the woods by something like that. I tried to find information that would help me understand what I had experienced, but it was no good. I wanted to talk about it with someone, someone who knew what these things were, what I saw out there, and who had some real knowledge on them. I really did, but I don't go talking about it anymore to anyone, and I'm not about to go back in the woods and look for them. Before I saw them, I didn't believe any stories like this. I understand if people don't want to believe me. What I say happened. Life is like that. But I don't care if someone else believes me or not. I know what I saw, and my brothers know what they saw. We know what we saw out there in those woods that evening. All right, guys, what a set of terrifying experiences. I hope you enjoyed them as much as I enjoyed sharing them with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. Your support is honestly what makes this channel continue to grow and go and what makes it a special and safe place for people to want to share their theories, ideas, and experiences without judgment or ridicule, simply treated with respect. Thank you, and that is all on you guys. With that being said, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, our pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and they are dangerous. Share this info with those people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.